So I'm here this afternoon with William Buse. It gives me great pleasure to sort of uh, have this conversation. I say a conversation because it, it is a conversation rather than an interview, but we're going to start with some interview questions. Good afternoon, William. Hello, Peter, and thank you for inviting me along. Right. I think we can establish that you were born, because you're sitting <laughs> here. Um, take us uh, from wherever you, uh, you know, through your career, from, from birth to sort of... Uh, where have we get to now, I suppose. So. Yeah, of course. So I was, well, I was born in Manchester uh, of Scottish parentage. Uh, all, my dis, all my parents, grandparents, all the way back, as far as we know, really, were Scottish. But my father was moved to Manchester in the war, and that's, uh, that's why I ended up being born there. Um, and I uh, grew up there and enjoyed my time then went to university uh, in St Andrews so went back to my Scottish roots if you like and fell out of that into a job in insurance which uh, I think I remember my father breathing a sigh of relief because his boy had got a career you know and, and, and that was me made for life I never quite saw it that way uh, he'd worked for ICI all his life and that was the way that his generation worked you know you joined a company and you worked with them uh, until you retired and of course, I haven't done that. I've worked in many things uh, through the insurance industry. I mean, roughly in seven year stints, actually, is one of the things I noticed looking back. Um, so I, I, um, I learned the underwriting uh, trade, did my uh, insurance exams, became a qualified chartered insurer. Um, you know, kind of followed a fairly traditional career until I joined uh, TSB, the bank, um, in 1995, I was headhunted to go and launch a new product for them. And uh, very soon after I joined, um, they merged with Lloyd's and the project I'd been hired to deliver was cancelled. And you know, there's a whole host of upheaval then, which was interesting. Um, but, uh, but I created a, a new role and I ended up as uh, head of business risk management for Lloyd's TSB, high standing title, uh, you know, quite a big job um, but really what I was doing was looking at how does the business make sure that a sudden change doesn't impact it badly um, and I was involved with running a lot of projects and I realized that putting a project team together and delivering something inside a large organization is remarkably similar to putting a small business together and delivering something in the small business um, and I took that knowledge and the experience in that and um, left the bank in 2001, so 19 years ago, and, and started working uh, with smaller businesses, helping them with strategy, with building the right teams around them. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, 2008, the big recession came along and I learned what it was like to lose pretty much all of your business fairly quickly. Um, came out the other side of that, still smiling, um, still with the business. Um, and uh, really at that point the business did change a little bit again to, to working with people who were ambitious, willing to change, um, interested in building a better business than the one they had. So I, I work with people who've got an established business but one that they know is not as good as it could be um, and are really looking for some insight into how to improve it by changing it and are willing to make the change. Um, and I, I've really found the place that I've, I think makes my heart sing and my soul soar. It's, it's where I have the most fun of all. I love it. Just reflecting back on that, we share a similar sort of pathway in terms of my father worked at the dockyard for something like, I think, 60 odd years and yeah. did the same job for all that time. And that he determined, I think, that perhaps that that, uh, that wasn't the way I was going to go. So he also was relieved when I left the towns that uh, we started at. So that's an interesting parallel there. Take me back to 2001 then, because uh, you work almost exclusively with smaller businesses, you know, sort of ones that are you know, you know, comfortable in their own skin, but have an improvement opportunity, but they are essentially small. Um, so how was your sort of scale, or, you know, rapid, radical change from working in TSB? How was your first few years? What did you learn from starting a small business? That's a dramatic change. Oh, yeah, yeah, I learned so much. Uh, I learned an awful lot. Actually, mostly I learned about myself uh, as, as much as anything else. And I, I learned uh, a lot about how uh, businesses work, which I had 
assumed uh, in a bigger business where there's, you know, there's a big marketing team and there's a big sales team and there's a big this team and a big that team. And a lot of what goes on within those teams is, is opaque. You don't really see it day to day. And I kind of thought I understood what marketing and sales were in a small business. I didn't. Um, you know, that was a hard lesson. Um, that it's something that, you know, getting the message right, getting honing the words so that people understand what you do um, is probably something I'm still working on nearly 20 years on. You know, it's it's not a simple thing to get the messaging right. Um, and it's not a simple thing to persuade people to part with their hard earned money um, to work with you. You know, that needs you to demonstrate that you've got the skill, that you've got the experience, that the chemistry is right. Um, and there's a whole host of things that go with that, that um, frankly, I wasn't very good at um, to begin with. Um, I was lucky. And sometimes in business, I think luck is a part of the mix. And I think you can make your luck. Um, I was lucky in that my first client when I left the bank um, came through a connection that I had from within the bank. I, I got a fairly long running project um, that lasted a couple of years when I first started. And it really helped me to you know, set the basis of my business outright. Um, in terms of delivery, which is just as important as all the other things. You know, you've got to be able to deliver what you do. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and I said, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a, a, a lot about how much I thought I knew and how much I actually knew. And that comparison was quite, you know, quite a big difference between the two things. And I think that taught me a little bit of humility and a little bit of... Uh, time to reflect is really useful and really spending time to think hard about what do I actually know here <laughs> what are the facts rather than what am I assuming and what do I think is true um, and that's held me in really good stead um, since I had that learning and you, you specialize on things such as strategy asking brilliant questions uh, facilitating complex problems for clients and sort of listening carefully which isn't in they, they sound listening particularly sounds easy but it's not, in my experience, it's not. I mean, and the one thing I notice that lots of business owners don't have is anyone that can listen carefully to them because life is busy and, and you know, and, and so on and so forth. But I mean, if, what, so what, if you kind of said, well, my daily typical client work would be something like this, why would people be coming to you and what, what sort of things would they be wanting to challenge you with? Well, I think you've touched on something really important, actually, and that, that is that, that people are busy and having somebody who genuinely is listening because they want to support and help and make sure that the, the person gets to the place they want to get to is actually really rare. It doesn't happen very often. Mm -hmm. And being given the space in which to share the issues the challenges the opportunities to help get the priorities right to map out you know what is the right big goal to go for um, and what should this business look like in two years or five years and being able to play with it a little bit and i i use that word very deliberately um, of playing with it a little bit because it's it's very easy to land in a kind of what do people want me to say you know oh, I, the commonest thing is that I hear from small businesses is I want to build a business to sell it. And if I ask them for how much and in what time scale, the answers usually have a five attached to them. Um, you know, it'll be five million pounds in five years or something like that. And they have no conscious plan to go between where they are and that point where they can sell it. It's just a ambition out there and that's fine there's nothing wrong with that ambition and there's nothing wrong with picking that time frame or those those amounts of money but if that's what you want to go, go to you've got to work back then and say well what does the business that that happens to in five years time what does it look like in one year's time yeah the number of people i have encountered who've said that who are no longer doing it is, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I could tell stories, but we're not here to do that. Um, exactly, exactly. Um, it's, oh, that, so it, that, it requires a little bit more than hope. 
Um, but I'm sure you're not like a human version of Alexa because, you know, the chief executive could just shout at Alexa every day and be listened to. I'm sure you do more than just listening. What else uh, is there there? Yeah, and I, and, and I mean, I think that comes down to how we, how do we know when we are really being listened to? And it's not because somebody is silent a bit in the room with their ears open. Um, there's something about a deep level of listening that hears nuance and subtlety and questions about the nuance and subtlety. Um, and it's actually, I think, we really know we've been heard when we're asked a question that explores into greater detail something that we have just said. So I'm putting words into your mouth now, but throw them back out if you don't like what I'm saying. You might be rather like the consulting uh, equivalent of Columbo, of saying, well, you keep mentioning that, sir, over there, but you're saying you want to focus on this over here, and you, I presume you skillfully both sort of direct the conversation to areas where you think there's an out chair or something that's not quite working right or some dissonance between what's being said and what's being done and I presume you also on occasion provide expertise from your background rather than just just listening when yeah. when it's appropriate uh, have I put too many words in here? Uh, I mean I think you're you're absolutely on the right there's something about Colombo that I love and it's it's that oh just one more thing <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that question of the course is the one that unlocks the case for him. And I and I kind of think that is part of what I do is looking for the question that unlocks the issue for the business owner and helps them to see things in a way that that lets them move things forward. Um but yeah, my expertise, uh, you know, I've run my own business as we've discussed. I've uh, you know, learned a lot about the things you can do wrong as well as the things you can do right. That's valuable for other people. Um you know, I, I'm really, you know, I'm very content to make mistakes because I learn from them. Um, but I'm also only content to learn from them if I can pass that on and help other people avoid the same fate uh, in the same circumstances. Um, so there's that bit. And I also I think there's something, uh, there's something about having a, what I call a confidant, somebody you can talk to who isn't emotionally attached to the business in the way the business owner is. Um, it can be uh, divorced from it at, at an emotional level. So they can be logical and analytical in a way that when you're very close to something, it's very hard to do. You know, if I'm quizzed about my business, I, I feel myself getting defensive when people touch on areas that I know are not as good as they could be, but how valuable that is because it means I get to learn where I need to focus. And hopefully that's, you know, what I do uh, for others. You touched on it earlier when you said that people, you know, they're engrossed in their business and therefore they're sort of head banging really, just constantly, you've got to get on with this. So actually having that, I think they call it a friendly co-pilot in consulting terms, but it's mm. someone who puts distance with them between them and, and she sees things in a new light, but also provides uh, the, the value of experience. Um, but moving on, you mentioned mistakes and failure, and I know it's an area we, we've discussed previously insofar as I've made a fair number of them, um, and they're all on display. But I mean, you can, it's a multiple choice question, you know, what would you consider have been your, the things you've done best to keep you going for 17 or so years? Because they do say that if you last more than you know, a year actually is quite good in a small business but if you're doing seven years you must be doing something right so the question is do you know what those right things are and the second alternative question is what what your greatest failure that you can <laughs> reveal to us uh well i think there's there's two there's two sides to that and they actually relate to the same underlying strategy um so let me start with the thing that i i messed up um i had a big client big part of my uh you know income came from one uh, one client and that's always dangerous we all know that that's always dangerous um and um i i'm going to say that i trusted them too much that's perhaps I, I don't want to give the wrong impression here i don't have there's no bad feeling in anything of the story that i'm about to tell you but i did end up with uh, a fairly large bad debt um, as a result of you know being a little bit too uh, willing to trust that it would all be all right eventually 
Um, and so I kept doing work when, um, in essence, I wasn't being paid for the work. Um, and that's, you know, that was a learning. It's not the end of the world. And those things happen. And as I say, um, there's no bad feeling about it. It is just one of those things that happens in business sometimes. And some businesses do hit bad patches. Some of them don't recover from them. And, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of that around the, you know, the, we saw a lot of it in 2008 in that recession. If we have another recession as well, as a result of the coronavirus thing that's happening right now, as we record this in 2020, then, you know, there'll be other businesses that don't get through that. And it's not, that's not a bad thing per se. I mean, there'll be mistakes that they've made and all the rest of it. And we can look at those and say, they should have done this, they should have done that. They didn't do those things. They haven't got through it. It's not the end of the world. Um, so, you know, I learned that lesson fairly quickly. The other side of that, the thing that I think has enabled me to keep going through those harder times is that I'm always aware of how much cash I've got in the business and how long it'll last for. Um, and, you know, we can all do lots of sums about revenue to please our egos about how much, you know, the top line is. We can look at lots of stuff around profitability to please ourselves on how good the books look but there's a bit in the middle that's cash and if you run out of cash it doesn't matter how much revenue you've got how much profit you've got you're dead yeah. so keep your eye on the cash um and, uh, I, and that's been really the thing that has meant i've always been able to get through whatever the world throws at me i used to have a wonderful uh, boss at the open university called don cooper and uh, when we used to teach finance it was a you know an academic course but he had a beautiful way of summarising that, which resonates with what you said for small businesses. He said, um, don't tell me how big your house is. Tell me whether you can pay the gas bill. <laughs> exactly right. The difference between the balance sheet and the, the cash flow. Terribly important, actually. Um, speaking, leading on to the future and, and perhaps resilience, can you say, I mean, have you any thoughts about how businesses can keep themselves alive to quote queen in other words keep themselves resilient during this time are there things are there any things you think that matter i mean i yeah i think uh, there's a whole host of uh, uh, these i think are strategic things that apply at any time of of where there's a a potential downturn in your markets whether that's you know right now that's happening across a whole range of markets all at once and it's and it's coordinated which is unusual um, but the first thing is, you know, really challenge yourself on expenditure, you know, and just take a good look at everything that's flowing out of the business and do you need to be spending it? Um, I, I always think when a, <clears throat> when a credit card expires, you suddenly find all these things that you've forgotten you were paying for, mm. but we're just on, you know, 10 pounds here, 20 pounds there. And suddenly you have to renew the credit card numbers and you look at them and go, oh, I haven't used that in months. Um, and in businesses, that's quite often true of software, You're quite often paying software licenses on an annual renewal. And you might have stopped using the software years ago, but, you know, then the renewal goes through and you go, oh, I must remember to cancel that before next year. Um, and, you know, so look at all of those because uh, they can add up. Um, and the other thing is because look at uh, where you can get additional revenue from in a time of difficulty. And the first place I always look for that is my existing clients. If, you, if you're having a sense that there's something difficult going on in the market, so will they. Can, is there something you can do to help them get through their challenges in the current market difficulty, whatever it is? And if there are, you know, will they pay for it? And uh, th that can be a way to bring more cash in. So, you know, cut the, out cut the outflows, raise the inflows, and, and keep the, the stock of cash up. And then if it turns down later, you've got the reserves. And if it doesn't turn down later, you've got some money to invest in growing the business quicker on the other side. So either way works. And looking towards the future, what, what are your personal plans in the next couple of years? What, what do you see, if you can see that far, what are the, what are the projects on the horizon for Willing Boost? So, uh, well, I've got a few projects on the go, as, as I probably always have. Um, so I don't know what my business is going to look like in a couple of years because I don't know what the market's going to look like, I don't know what the world's going to look like. I don't think any of us do. I, I do think that we will be in a 
different way of working. I think there'll be even more portfolio career type work, more people like you and I collaborating together to do collective work. And I think that to me is probably the most interesting part of what could happen here is that we might find there are um, in the small businesses that I work with now, there are quite often small collaborations between two or three businesses to do, you know, a project that's bigger than any one of them could handle. But what if there were 60 or 70 small businesses that came together to, for example, solve the problem of PPE in hospitals um, or came together to solve, a, you know, a big planning problem for something like, uh, you know, building the infrastructure for railways or, you know, that just was all individual people running their own businesses, but collectively brought the right skills together. Um, and at the moment, it's too difficult to do that because it's too many pieces to coordinate. But I think the current crisis has shown us actually you can you can do that. So that's one place I would like, if it does come about, I would like to be involved in helping to bring the skills and the knowledge that I have in how you bring a project team together quickly and make it effective. Um, and I absolutely know that you have the skills already to bring those diverse talents, uh, having seen you working this machinery on here that we're using today. I've seen you, sat, um, and it's streets ahead of any experience I've had in most uh, professional organisations. So when you talk about collaborating with people that you don't own, or diverse people that bring different things to the party, I think we may learn in the future that we don't need to just put everyone in a meeting room who already know each other and actually share the same competency <laughs> and just fight it out for two hours with tea and biscuits. What we desperately need to solve complex problems is these diverse talents that often reside in different places. Some of them are individuals working alone and we need someone to orchestrate that complexity, which is what I noticed that you do on your sort of online facilitation. So I think that re that's going to be incredibly valuable for the future. Uh, well, I think so too. You may know a musician called John Mayer, mm -hmm. singer, songwriter, guitarist. Um, he, one of his albums, I can't remember which one, but he was, he was very keen to get a particular style of cover art for it that looked a little bit like a stained glass window. And he searched all over the world using these sorts of tools to find the right designer. Eventually found him. He's based in America somewhere. He found a guy in Cornwall um, that did the cover for one of his albums. Um, and, um, and then he also made the same cover because he, he was a stained glass window artist as well as a designer. And he made the same cover in a stained glass window. There's a video on it somewhere, which is fascinating. About how they work together at a distance just to... Get so that John Mayer got exactly the cover that he wanted, but he had to find exactly the right resource to produce it that really understood what he wanted. And that to me is the thing here that we can go to anybody, wherever you are, you can go and find the best person in the world at that one thing. And yeah. if that's true, then we have to be the best person in the world at our one thing, yeah. whatever that is. The question of what I call inventive search is facilitated by this technology but some people drown in it and they yeah. need a, yeah. an experienced guide and someone who can get you there quickly. I think that's probably what, what you're going to be doing in the nearest future, if, if not already, actually, I'm sure you are. So William, uh, where can we find you? So uh, because I've got an unusual surname and it's on the screen, B U I S T very easy to su just search for that and you'll find me uh, cause I'm all over the internet, like a rash really. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but also uh, my email is william at williambust.com. So that's nice and easy too. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much for uh, this short but in incredibly uh, potent dialogue. And um, I shall look forward to seeing some of your other uh, work online, which I know you do all the time with facilitating diverse groups and clients. And of course, people just wander into your orbit. So thank you very much, William. That's great. Thank you, Peter.